Hey, welcome to Rise Church. Thanks so much for joining us online today. We believe that Jesus wants to do so much for you and through you, and we'd love to hear how he's working in your life. Please take a second to email your story to stories at rise-church.com. We hope you leave today feeling encouraged and uplifted. Enjoy the message. All right, we loosened up. Let's shift gears just a little bit and let's jump into the message. And you don't have to answer this one because I know what we would all answer. In your life, would you rather be defined by your failures or your future? And the reason that I know that none of you want to be defined by your failures is come, some of you have screwed up royally in your life. And you wish that actually people would forget about all those things that you've done because you want to leave that past behind you because maybe God has something for your future. I want to teach a message entitled today, Between Two Fires. If you give me a second, I'm going to light my fires down here. I'm a Boy Scout. <laughs> Somebody's like, wow, that's pretty cool. Somebody else is like, I'm not impressed at all. Should have used a real fire, bro. Okay, Pyro, calm down. This is the best we could do. Between two fires, and we're gonna talk about both of these fires as we go today, I wanna talk to you about the life of a guy named Peter. And I wanna talk about Peter's life in relation to him following after Jesus and how those two lives intersected. And I wanna pick up where Jesus and Peter first encounter each other in Luke chapter five. Jesus is, let me set the scene, he's teaching, he's on this beach, ocean, lake, seashore, and he's teaching, and there's so many people crowding around him that he actually gets into a boat to start teaching, and the boat he gets into is a guy named Peter. He says he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Peter, and he asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. Let's keep going. When he had finished speaking, he said to Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Let's read on. Peter answered, Master, no offense, you're a great teacher. Uh, but I've been fishing my whole life, and uh, we worked hard all night, and I'm just being honest, they just ain't biting. Like, the, we ain't caught nothing. But, this is a big old but, and our lives would be better if we would adopt this, because you say so. Like, what you're asking me to do right now, it doesn't make sense. What you're asking me to do, I actually don't even wanna do. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. Let's keep reading. When they had done so, come on somebody, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. We read on and it says this, when Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, man, get away from me. Like I realized, you're something special. I'm nobody, I'm just a sinful man. Jesus said this to Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, Peter, you're gonna fish for people. From now on, Peter, I'm gonna give a new purpose to your life. So they pulled their boats up on the shore. They left everything, and they followed him. When I read the Bible, I love Peter's life because it's so relatable. When I read the Bible, I'm grateful that God didn't just put everybody's perfection in the Bible, that he included people's mistakes and failures and mess. And Peter is one of the most ones in the Bible who we see, man, in one moment, like he steps out in great faith, but then in another moment, man, he just falls flat on his face. And I'm like, man, I've been there before. Some moments, man, I trust God for all things. And then other moments, I'm like, God, where are you? Amen. I think about the moment where Jesus was walking on the water to the disciples and they're freaking out and going, what's going on? And then all of a sudden they realize, oh, it's Jesus. And Peter calls out to Jesus, Jesus! That looks really cool. Can I do that? And Jesus is like, come on, Peter, let's go. And you grew up in church, so you know the story, and we give Peter a bad rap because we know that he started to sing, but, but none of the other disciples even got out of the boat. And so Peter gets out of the boat, and he's doing the thing, man. And he is walking on water. But then the story goes on that the wind starts to pick up. The storm starts to come. And he looks all around, and he sees the, the wind and the waves, and he realizes, I've made a huge mistake. And he starts to sink. In other moments, we find Peter saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Raise your hand if you have that problem. 
Raise your hand if you know somebody that really has that problem. Yeah, raise your hand if they're sitting by you right now. Okay, yeah. In one moment, Jesus is washing his disciples' feet, and he's going from disciple to disciple, and he finally gets to Peter, and Peter's like, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus is like, Peter, like, I have to wash your feet. Like, if I don't wash your feet, then, then you're not really one of my followers. Like, hey, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, then you, man, we're not really connecting on this level that, that I want to. And then so Peter's like, then wash all of me. To which Jesus is like, feet's fine, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's not make it weird, bro. Like, jeez, Peter. And so we find Peter, great faith, falls flat on, flat on his face. Says the wrong thing at the wrong time. Super relatable. We fast forward in both Jesus' life and Peter's life, and Jesus is about to come to the end of his life, and he's having this meal with his closest followers, and at the end of the meal, he looks at Peter and he says to Peter, Peter, I got good news, and I got bad news. Now, how many of you, if somebody says that to you, you're a normal, sane person, you like to hear the bad news first? Why do we like to hear the bad news first? Because hopefully, Whatever the bad news is, there is a good news that is coming that will hopefully outweigh whatever that bad news was. And that's how Jesus did it, okay? So if Jesus did it, you're not better than Jesus, start doing it that way. Don't tell somebody the good news first and then tell them bad news, that doesn't work. Then they forget the good news. Just start doing it right, please. <laughs> Jesus says to Peter, and he calls him Simon, which was his name before he started following Jesus. He says, Simon, Simon. And I don't know, I just sometimes read humor into the Bible. I think it's because Simon wasn't paying attention. That's what I have to do with my kids when they're not listening, right? Emmy, Emmy! <laughs> Simon. Simon, listen, come on, Peter. Here's the bad news. Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. Translation, Satan himself has asked to take you out. That's pretty bad news. But Jesus says, here's the good news. But I told him he couldn't. He didn't say that. I wish Jesus would have said that. Satan said he wants to take you out. I told him he couldn't. Here's the good news. I prayed for you, Simon. If I'm Peter in that moment, I'm like, I'm gonna need you to do a little more than praying for me. I prayed that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now, if I'm Peter in this moment, I'm probably a little frustrated at Jesus because Jesus, I don't know if you remember this, but I used to be a fisherman. You asked me to follow you, I dropped everything and I followed you. And for three years, I've been by your side. I've been your right hand man. And now all of a sudden, you're telling me that, that I'm gonna bail on you? Come on. Jesus then gets betrayed by another one of his followers, Judas. Roman soldiers come to arrest him. And I think Peter in that moment was like, and I need to prove to Jesus that I'm his guy. And so we read this in Luke 22. But he replied, Lord, man, I'm actually ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Okay, Jesus, so now you're telling me that I, 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 my faith's gonna fail and I'm gonna deny you? Nah, I ain't gonna do that. Let's read on. When Jesus' followers saw what was going on, this is the Roman soldiers coming to arrest him, they said, Lord, should we go west side on him? <laughs> One of the disciples was like, Duva. Do not repeat that back. I ain't going down like that. Lord, Lord, should we, sh we strike him with our swords? One of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. Again, you're not reading humor into the Bible from time to time. You're just reading it wrong. Because I love how it says, one of them. How do we know who actually cut off the guy's ear? How do we know it's Peter? Because the other books of the Bible that tell the life of Jesus all said, and then Peter cut the guy's ear off. To which I like to think in my mind that Peter walked up to Luke and was like, Luke, I'll give you 20 bucks if you leave my name out of that whole ear thing. Luke was like, deal. <laughs> the other guys were like, no deal, bro. We're putting your name in there. Which is one of also one of the grossest miracles ever because Peter cuts the guy's ear off. It falls on the ground. And everybody's like, where's the ear? And some guy's like, I found it over here, but I'm not touching it. That's gross. Jesus heals the guy's ear. 
And then we read on. Jesus gets arrested. You start to see what happens with Peter. So they arrested him, and they led him to the high priest's home, and Peter, here it is, who had been following Jesus so close for three years, now all of a sudden is following at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. Let's read on. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers, but Peter denied it. Woman, please, I don't even know him. One denial. After a while, someone else looked up at him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I'm not, Peter replied. Two, about an hour later, someone insisted, this must be one of them. Because he's a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster, rooster crowed. And I think that the next verse is probably one of the saddest verses in all of the Bible. It says, at that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. At that moment of his third denial, the Lord himself, Jesus, turned and locked eyes with Peter. Can you imagine how Peter felt in that moment? Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And Peter, here it is, left the courtyard weeping bitterly. Can you imagine the guilt and the shame that Peter felt? Jesus is walking through one of the most difficult moments of his life. And the guy that had been so close to him for the past three years denies that he even knows him. And I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful for the people in my life that when I walk through something difficult, man, they're walking through it with me. It's good to have some friends. It's good to have some family. And in this moment, that's what Jesus needed. And Peter bailed on him. And he was hurting so much, he had just hurt his Savior. He knew what he did. He left just weeping bitterly, sobbing uncontrollably. And here's what I know about my life and your life. We can all relate to Peter because we all have failures. Anybody want to be honest this morning and go, I know I got failures. Okay, let's try that again because not everybody raised their hand. You were too busy polishing your halo, apparently. <laughs> raise your hand if you know you got failures. Okay, raise your hand if you think the person beside you has more failures than you, though. Yeah, we know. I might have had a little too much fun with that. Peter failed the guy that he loved the most. He let him down. And when he did, in that moment, he walks away, and the guilt and the shame must have ate away at him because Peter literally, get this, quits ministry altogether. He's like, I'm out, I'm done, I can't do that anymore. He goes back to doing what he was doing before he met Jesus, he goes back to fishing. Aren't you grateful that we serve a God who loves us? Aren't you grateful that we serve a God, come on here, I wrote it down like this, God is too good, somebody say too good, <laughs> to let us stay stuck in our fish. We're gonna to get to the second fire in just a moment, but this fire represents Peter's greatest failure. He's standing around a fire. He's approached by three different people. Aren't you one of his followers? No, 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 no. I don't even know who that guy is. It was a, it was a failure moment of Peter's. And some of you right now, I believe you're living in this fire. You are letting your failures define you. Maybe it was something you did five years ago, 10 years ago, 20. Maybe it was something you did last month. You are letting your failures define you. Some of you, maybe it's not your failures that are defining you, but like Peter, you're denying Jesus with your life right now. Some of you are in our church today, and I'm so glad that you're here. We love you, God loves you. I hope that you hear that very clearly. But the life you're living right now, basically you're saying, God, I want nothing to do with you. You are denying him 
by how you live your life. Some of you don't have a relationship with God at all. Others of you, you actually do have a relationship with God. Or you're, maybe I should phrase it like this. You believe in God. You believe in Jesus. You believe that Jesus died for your sins. But you're not living surrendered to him. That's a big difference. And I'm not trying to scare anybody here. That's not the tactic we take when we preach. But I think a reckoning is gonna come at the end of some of our lives in eternity where the Lord looks at us and goes, hey, did you believe in me? And we say, yeah, I believed in you. He goes, but you didn't live like it. You actually lived for yourself. You actually did your own thing. You never surrendered your life to me. I think some of you are in a place right now and things are off in your life and I just need to let you know why they're off in your life. Because you're living for yourself. Maybe some of you, that's the reason we haven't seen you in a while. Because you're not living a surrender life to Jesus. And God has something more for you. He's got something better. He always does. And this fire right here, I'm telling you, there's a better fire to stand by. And I'm going to get there in just a minute. And we know how the story goes. Hopefully you do. If you don't, let me tell you some amazing news. He gets arrested, Jesus. He gets hung on a cross. He dies for the sins of the world. He dies for my sins and your sins. My mess and your mess. My junk and your junk. He dies for it all. They put him in like a cave. He wasn't buried in the ground. He was in like a cave. They rolled this huge rock in front of him. But three days later, Jesus came busting up out of that tomb saying, what's good, devil? I'm back. And the resurrection of Jesus and it's good news for all people, all people. And what I love about Jesus is that when he resurrects, he's got an agenda. Because he knows he's only gonna be on the earth for a little bit longer, 40 days in fact. And he's got an agenda, he's got a plan, and he sets out to accomplish that plan. And one of the first things that he does in that plan is to find his boy, Peter. And in Mark chapter 16, it says, when they, this is the women that were going to the tomb, when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in white robes sitting on the right side. Let's read on. The women were shocked, but the angel said, hey man, don't be alarmed. I know you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. Come on, somebody. You read it wrong. That should say, he ain't here. Come on, he is risen from the dead. Not bad that. Half of them clap for you raising from the dead. We'll see if we can get the rest of them. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now, go and tell his disciples, <laughs> and Peter, and I, I just need somebody to know, like, I didn't add that. That's in the Bible. But wasn't Peter one of his disciples? Yeah, he was. But our Savior Jesus is a personal Savior. And he knew that Peter had denied him and so he said, I want you to specifically let Peter know. Because I know that Peter's living in guilt and shame right now. Some of you, I, I saw you when you walked in today. You hadn't been here in a while. You kind of walked in with your head down. You felt shame, like I ain't been here in a while. It's been a while. No guilt and shame. We're so glad you're here. We're glad you're here today. We want you back next week. We want you back next That's That's what we want. I mean, man, please. Go, go tell the disciples. But make sure you specifically tell Peter. Jesus is resurrected now. And in his resurrected state, in his resurrected body, he goes and he has a conversation with the disciples. And you're going to find out it's a little familiar. John 21, Peter says, man, I'm going out to fish. They said, eh, we'll go with you. So they went out, they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Sound familiar? Let's read on. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples, they didn't realize that it was Jesus. He was doing a Jesus juke on them. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Again, you gotta read the humor into the Bible. He knew they hadn't caught nothing. Don't you love it when your friends know you went out fishing? Now, if you ask any man or woman in here that goes out fishing, what are they gonna tell you? I just like, it's so relaxing. I just love to go out. Just, I just love to be on the water. No, you wanna catch fish. 
And when you don't catch fish, that's frustrating. And when your friends know you didn't catch some fish, they like to give you a hard time. Do you catch anything? And you know that they know you didn't catch anything. And you just want to punch them in the throat, but you can't do that. Maybe. No, they answered. We didn't catch anything. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Which is so foolish, right? So we're in a boat. There's no fish over here, but magically there's going to be fish over here. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Does that sound familiar of the first time they encountered Jesus? Now, one of them was kind of smart. His name's John. And it says this, then the disciple whom Jesus loved. Notice John is writing this. He didn't call himself John. It's a little braggadocious, right? He's like, I'm not gonna call myself John. I'm gonna call myself the disciple that Jesus loved. I'm writing it, whatever. He said to Peter, hey, Peter, I think it's the Lord. Do you remember how it happened last time? Do you remember how we were in the boat and we hadn't caught anything and he was like, throw your nets out and we were like, nah, that's not gonna work, but if you say so, we'll do it and they caught so many, we couldn't pull it in. Like that same thing just happened. I think it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him. Apparently he was fishing naked. <laughs> Told you you could relate to Peter. And he jumped into the water. And if we go on to read the following verses, we realize he's the only one that did that. The rest of them stayed in the boat and just paddled to shore. And it was 100 yards, a football field. But that's Peter, right? It's Jesus, I'm coming! When they get to the shore, they find that Jesus is there. He himself has a fire going. He made the fire. They sit down and Jesus already has some fish on the fire and he tells them to bring some of their fish and they put them on the fire and they have this meal together. When they get done with the meal, Jesus, has this conversation. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, I'm so disappointed in you. He didn't say that. Simon, son of John, how could you deny me? He didn't say that either. <laughs> he doesn't even bring up the denial. Some of you have a God that just holds your sin and your mess over top of you. He just says, Simon, son of John, hey, do you love me more than these? This wasn't a competition thing, like, do you love me more than the other followers? That wasn't it. He just wanted to say, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. This wasn't literally talking about his followers, his other people. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Two. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Could you imagine how frustrated Peter was? Like, why do you keep asking me the same question over and over? And I think it was because Jesus was trying to let Peter know, Peter, I know that you love me. I just need you to remember that you love me because I think you've been living in this fire of your failures and I've got a future for you over here and I need you to remember you really do love me and I really do love you. I got a purpose for your life. I got some people that I need you to minister to because Peter, I'm not gonna be here much longer. I'm actually about to go back up to heaven with my father and I need you to lead this thing. I'm actually gonna use you, Peter, to birth this movement called the church. And we know that Peter goes on to preach a message and 3,000 people put their faith in Jesus and the church comes alive. 
All because Peter chose not to live in his failures, but to live in the better future that God has for him. I said in the last service that I have four kids. I don't, I only have three. That I know of, right? We're pregnant. I'm just teasing, we're not. Three kids, we do have a dog though, so it's not that hard. Um, I got three kids. Uh, Our firstborn was a boy. Dad, let's go. Uh, and then and then our second came two years later, a little girl. Yeah. And then because God has jokes seven years later, um, <laughs> we had another girl. My middle daughter, she's 11 now. I can't remember when she did it, but at, probably at the age of five, every time I would tell her good night, and I'd say, I love you, she'd say back to me, I love you too. And I'd say, I love you more. She'd say, I love you more. And then she'd say, I love you the most. And then I'd say, I said it first. And, or she'd say, I said it first. And I'd say, I said it last. And I went into the past and I said it before you. And this is a whole little thing. You don't need to know all that. But it's just our thing. We went back and forth. I love you. I love you more. I love you. I love you more. My four-year-old now, our third child, she's adopted the same thing, but she, she's got her own way of doing it. So I'll tell her, I love you. And then she'll say to me, I love you more than all the sand on the ocean. Right. And then I'll say, I love you more than all the stars in the sky. She'll say, that's not more than my love. I love you more than the grass and the cars and the buildings and the trees and the, love you more. The fire that Jesus built, where Peter had denied Jesus three times over here at this fire, Jesus restores Peter three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love? It restores him. This second fire is Jesus's, I love you more. And I need somebody to open your ears and open your heart because I need you to understand that God loves you more than your failures. God loves you more than your denials. Hey, God loves you more. You're a grown adult who has been rejecting God your entire life. You're a grown adult that has been living selfishly for yourself. God has been trying to get your attention. You've come to Easter after Easter here at our church. And every time God tries to get your attention and every time you reject him and God loves you more than your rejection. And all he's asking you is this. Hey, do you love me? Because I've got a future for you. I actually want to do something great in you. But you're the only one that can make that decision. Nobody else can make it for you. The choice is up to you. He loves you more than your sin. He loves you more than your rejection. He's never given up on you for a second. The really good news is this. We don't have to stay stuck in our failures because God has a better future greater future and purpose for our lives. So let me just talk to the teenager, to the man here that didn't want to be here today, the woman that didn't think God wanted her to walk through the doors of the church today. Whoever you are, listen, God loves you. He's always loved you. He loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. What fire do you want to stand around? What fire do you want to define you? I entitled this message Between Two Fires because you know what took place between Jesus's deni- or Peter's denial and Jesus' restoration? Resurrection. The death, burial, and resurrection. It changes every it changed everything for Peter. It can change everything for you. You can sit here with your hands in your pocket, you can sit here with your arms folded, or you can open your heart and say, God, I'm ready. Come into my life and change me forever. Every head bowed, every eye closed. The Spirit of God is here. He's moving. He's working in people's lives. And if you're ready, he's ready to come in and change everything for you. He loves you. He cares about you. He brought you here today because he's got a better future for your life. And all he's asking for you to do today is to surrender your life to him. To make him Savior and Lord of your life. What does Savior mean? Is that you believe that he died on the cross for your sins. What does Lord mean? It means that you're surrendering everything to him. That you're not living for yourself anymore. You're giving it all to him. If 
that's you in this place. I can't explain what's happening in you right now. It's supernatural. But there is a stirring in your heart. You feel it. That's the Holy Spirit drawing you to Jesus. Would you just say yes to him right now? Whether you're in this room, watching online from somewhere, in the lobby, wherever you are right now, just surrender your heart to God. He loves you. And if that's you in this place with nobody looking around. Thanks for watching today. If you'd like to continue the conversation, you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram. If our church has had an impact on you and you'd like to support all that Jesus is doing in this place, you can do so by going to rise-church.com slash give and select the giving option that best suits you. Thanks so much for joining us online and we hope you have a blessed week.